Hello everyone, today we'll go over the latter part of homework 10. Let's start by introducing the alternating series. Those are the series of the form n is equal with 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the n times a n or n is equal with 1 to infinity. Again, the starting point doesn't really matter. It can start from any given number to the n plus 1, a n, where we consider that a n is positive at this point. If we have a sequence that alternates, uh, alternates the sign, that counts as well, and we can bring it into this form. Now, we also have the alternating series test of convergence. That is that if we have that a n is a positive or at least not negative sequence that decreases and that limit of just that sequence not the, taking into account the minus one to the n in front of it is equal with zero then the alternating series from one or any starting point to infinity of minus one to the n I n converges and so does the other form that we have n plus one. I'm going to stop writing both because if one converges, so does the other. We can notice that one it is the previous one times minus one. So since it is a multiplication by constant, then that implies that if one converges, so does the other. Now we also have something for the error. If a n satisfies the same as above, satisfies the conditions for the alternating series test, the one we previously mentioned, then the error up to the m term, let's note it as error m, which is equal with the value of the series, again, that can be plus one, depending on what is the formation of the series, minus the partial sum up to m, then that is bounded by the next term. That is the absolute value of the term of the series, since we have a minus one to the end, or if we have separated it already, that can be the value of the n plus 1 term of the sequence that is positive now. Now that we have that, we might bump into a case where the alternating series converges, <clears throat> but if we take absolute values, then it doesn't. That is, separates the conditional and absolute convergence. If we have that, the absolute value of a the sum of the absolute value of a sequence converges, where the sequence can now be positive, negative, increasing, or decreasing. This is not the case as the previous one. We just assume that it is a sequence that we sum. If we have that the absolute value of this converges, we say that the sum from one to infinity or any starting point of the sequence itself now without absolute values converges absolutely. Notice that if we have that the series is already positive, then the absolute value means more nothing. And hence we have that absolute convergence is the exact same thing as convergence. But when we have that the sequence that we sum is not always positive, then we have a difference there. Now, more specifically, if we have that a series does converge and we have that it doesn't conserve, uh, converge if we have the absolute values of the same sequence, so this one diverts, then we say that the first one that converges converges conditionally. 
And that is the difference between absolute and conditional convergence. If the sequence series that we sum is positive, they coincide. But if the series that we sum changes in signs, not necessarily every other term, but it has both infinitely many positive and infinitely many negative ones, then it might be the case that the absolute value does not converge, while the series itself converges. And in that case, we have conditional convergence. Now, with that at hand, let us see the exercises that we have. Let's examine the third exercise. For 3a, we will state why we cannot use the alternating series. Test, sorry, we cannot test, uh, state the alternating series test. For minus 1 to the n over 2 to the minus n. And then determine if it converges or diverges. So that is the sequence that we sum. And we can write it as minus 1 to the n times 1 over 2 to the minus n and this part is our bn now we can also see that bn is equal with 2 to the n now what do we have to check before applying the alternating series test we have to have a positive bn which is the case a positive sequence with a coefficient minus 1 to the n or minus 1 to the n plus 1 that decreases and has limit to infinity as n goes to infinity. A limit with zero as n goes to infinity. Now, the case here, it is bn is increasing, not decreasing. So we cannot apply the alternating series test. Also, one can notice that the limit of this sequence goes to infinity instead of zero. Hence, we couldn't use it with that argument as well. Now, since we see that the limit goes to infinity, that implies that if we take the limit of the original series, it won't go to zero. It might does not exist, but it won't definitely go to zero. Hence, the divergence test will give us that this series, the original one, diverges to begin with. Let's check this out, how to state that. So examining the original series, we have limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence that we sum, which is equal in our case with limit as n goes to infinity of minus one to the n times two to the n as we stated. Now, the rule for the product of the limits can be applied only in the case that both limits exist, but the limit of minus one to the n as n goes to infinity does not exist because it is between 1 and minus 1 all the time. It fluctuates between those two. So the idea is that this limit here depends on if we approach from an even or an odd number infinity. If we have an odd, then a minus 1 to an odd number will give us minus 1 times 2 to the n will still go to infinity. So we have minus infinity. Well, if we approach from an even number, then minus 1 to an even will give us 1, and 2 to the n will still go to infinity, so we get plus infinity. Since if we approach infinity from a different point of view, we get a different result that implies that there is not just one thing for this limit, it fluctuates between the values, so it doesn't converge. So the limit does not exist here. The the uh, the divergence test takes, takes that into account. Remember, the limit can be different than zero or simply does not exist in order to infer divergence with the divergence test. So by the divergence test, the series from one to infinity of minus one to the n over two to the minus n diverges. Let's go to part B now. For B, we will examine the sum from one to infinity, minus one to the n plus one, times sine of pi over two, 
plus and pi over n plus one. Now, why we can't use the alternating series test? It seems like something that will probably decrease. In order to examine uh, to use the alternating series test, we must first make sure that we have an alternating series. Remember that sine and cosine can take minus one and one infinitely many values, infinitely many times. So it might, after all, cancel this minus one to the n plus one. Let's check out then the value just the part of the sequence that involves the trigonometric function. Sine, if we plug in n is equal with one here, that is sine of pi over two pi, which is the three pi over two minus one. Plugging in n is equal with two, we get sine of pi over two plus two pi, which is since sine and cosine have a period of two pi, the plus two pi over two won't affect the value, and that is equal with one. Plug in three pi over two. That can be written also as sine of pi over two plus pi plus two pi, I just break the three pi into pi plus two pi. And now the period it gives me that is equal with sine pi over two plus pi, which is equal with minus one. It is actually equal with the first term, just by the period of the trig function. Same goes for if we plug in four, that will be equal with sine pi over two of plus two pi plus two pi, the first one will bring us at this point, the second one will bring us there, and that will be one. So we see that, after all, we have the following. Sine of pi over two plus odd times pi is equal with minus one, which we can see it also as minus one to the odd, if we want to create another term there. Sine of pi plus even pi is equal with one, which can be seen as minus one to the even. Since whatever we plug in, even or odd, is what we take the exponent of minus one, we can write it as sine of pi over two of any given number is equal with minus one to the n. If it was flipping, plugging in odd gives us even, plugging in even gives us odd, then we would have minus one to the n plus one to flip it. Here we see that this term over there creates another minus one to the n. So the series that we have, it is actually equal. Let us write the original one first. It's actually equal with uh, where we're starting at one. Minus one to the n plus one times minus one to the n over n plus one. Now remember there is a property a to the b times a to the c is equal with a to the b plus c. And that can go the other way around. So I have minus one to the two n plus one over n plus one. Now I'm going to break that down into two chunks. The one will be minus 1 to the 2n times minus 1 to the first power. Now minus 1 to an even number, since that is 2 times n, it will always remain even. That is always 1. So it won't affect me. So my series after all is equal with a series from 1 to infinity of minus 1 over n plus 1 or minus one over n plus one. Now this one diverges. We can either do a limit comparison test with a harmonic that is one over n, or one can just do the trick that we saw last time, where we're gonna set m is equal with n plus one, which will imply that n was equal with one, m is equal with two, and when to infinity will give us m goes to infinity. So that series become m from two, to infinity, one over, it was n plus one, so it becomes m, and that is the harmonic and diverges. So at the same time, while investigating if it was an alternating series, we found the divergence as well. 
up to this point, we were investigating if we have an alternating series. Since the minus one to the n, because we had two of them, became just one here, at this point, we lost the fact that we have an alternating series. It doesn't alternate anymore. It remains negative. We took the negative common factor of minus one, so we had a positive series inside. And because that was similar enough to the harmonic, either a limit comparison test or changing the value that you sum from in order to make it look exactly like the harmonic, will do the trick to infer the divergence. Let's proceed to four, where we have to judge the convergence, the absolute convergence, the conditional convergence, or if we have convergence at all to any of the given ones. So for A, for us will be the sum from one to infinity, minus one to the n, 2n over 2n plus six. A good idea is to immediately check the absolute value of your series. to Check for absolute convergence, because if you have absolute convergence, then you have normal convergence as well. So that will complete the exercise immediately. So the absolute value of the above, the minus one to the n will just go away since the absolute value of that is just one always. It's just a series of 2n over 2n plus 6. Now, if we're familiar enough with the limits, we know that the limit of a fraction that involves numinator polynomial and denominator polynomial, if the polynomials of the same degree, in this case, they're both of degree 1, we only have linear terms of n, then that limit will be a finite value that is not a zero. So I'm going to go, given that I have that in mind, for a divergence test here. So the limit of this sequence as n goes to infinity, if we take a common factor and a n of the denominator, the n's cancel out, and we are left with the limit as n goes to infinity, two over two plus six over n, which is two over two plus zero, which is one. Since that is different than zero, by div test, diverges. Beware when we do that, we checked the series of the absolute value of the original one, original sequence. So we just showed so far that we don't have absolute convergence. We might still have conditional convergence. So what to do, how do we proceed now? We go back to the original series. Unfortunately, we did not have absolute convergence. So we'll have to investigate the conditional one as well. Now, this is the positive part. That is given by a function because I'm gonna check if it increases or decreases with the derivative. Remember that a function increases if the derivative is positive and decreases if the derivative is negative. First of all, make sure that we are dealing with something that is positive. The denominator is greater than zero since we'll start from n is equal to one. The denominator is a sum of two positive things since we start from n is equal to one. Hence, my function is indeed positive. So any value of the sequence is positive. Let's examine the derivative though. For this function, let's go over the derivative. The derivative of a fraction, function, it is the derivative of the numerator, the derivative of 2x is 2, times the denominator, minus the derivative of the denominator, the derivative of 2x plus 6 is 2, times the numerator, divided by the denominator squared. So we do some calculations here, we distribute the multiplications where needed, and we have 4x plus 6 minus 4x divided by 2x plus 6 squared. So we have that the derivative is 6 over 2x plus 6 squared. Now, the numerator is always positive, it's just a positive number, and the denominator, it is a perfect square. So it is 
greater or equal than zero, but it is greater than zero since we plug in only positive values for m. Hence, we have that the derivative is positive. Then, what do we have here? We have that the function is increasing not decreasing, so we cannot apply the alternating series test. f of x increases, does not decrease. We cannot apply, hence, the alternating series test. Okay, but again we had the following thing, that the limit of the absolute value of the sequence was a finite value and equal with 1. If we make the sequence alternate, ignore the absolute value, then that thing will go to 1 and minus 1 because it flips back and forth. So we're probably going to have a limit that does not exist. Hence, the, the divergence test will give us an answer. So let's go for the divergence test and examine the limit of the alternating sequence now. 2 to the n over 2 to the n plus 6. Now, as we did before, we'll split it into odd and evens. If n is odd and goes to infinity, then we get minus 1 to the odd gives us minus. So we get minus, not infinity, we investigated the limit of this one earlier, it was 1. We investigated it when we were checking for absolute, conver uh, for absolute convergence, yes. If n is even though, then we have that this thing is always 1, hence it goes to 1, since the other part goes to 1 as well. Hence, we see that the limit must take those two values, which cannot be because the limit can only have one value. Hence, it does not exist. And by the diver divergence test, we have that the series diverges. So we don't have neither an absolute nor a conditional convergence. Now, is there a good way to predict this? Actually, yes. If we go for the convergence, the, the absolute convergence, and we apply the div test there, and we see the, the divergence test gives us that it doesn't converge, that implies that the limit was not zero to begin with. So if we do the divergence test again on the alternating series, the limit still must be different than zero. It might not exist, as it is the case here, because it goes back and forth between a positive and a negative value, or plus infinity and minus infinity, but it will probably does not exist. So if we infer that the absolute convergence does, is, does not hold because of the divergence test, then the divergence test is a good thing to go for for the, for the conditional convergence as well. It might not work, but in most cases it will. Assuming that we used it in the conditional one as well. Now let's go to part B. For B, we have the sum from 3 to infinity of minus 1 to the n times 2n square over n to the 5n to the third minus 1. Here I'm going to go again with the absolute convergence in the beginning. So I'm going to investigate the absolute value and then sum it. This will give us a series from n is equal with 3 to infinity of 2n squared over 5n cubed minus 1. Notice that the denominator is always positive for n greater or equal than 3. The starting point does not really affect us. It's just different to make sure that we understand that it doesn't affect us. So what to go for? Here we don't have two polynomials of the same degree in the numerator and the denominator. More specifically, the denominator has a smaller degree, the numerator has a smaller degree than the denominator, so the limit will probably be zero. So a divergence test is not a good call here. So I'm gonna go 
because that is pretty similar to n squared over n cubed, which is one over n, I'm going to use the limit comparison test. So I'm gonna compare with the harmonic, which diverges. If I get that the limit is a finite value different than zero or infinity, then I have that this series diverges as well. Let's check it out. Limit as same goes to infinity of 2n squared over 5n cubed minus 1 divided by 1 over n is equal with the limit as n goes to infinity of 2n cubed over 5n cubed minus 1 when we simplify the fraction. We will take common factor n cubed from the denominator over n cubed. The n cubed cancels out and we have that that is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity 2 over 5 minus 1 over n cubed which is 2 over 5. That is a finite value different than 0 or infinity but it's not infinity. So we do have whatever one series did so will the other. Since the original one diverged, the harmonic one diverged, Hence, that is the case for the absolute value of the series that we investigated. So we have that it's different than zero. This series also diverges. So we don't have absolute convergence. We might though have conditional one. Now let's check have a series from n is equal with 3 minus 1 to the n of 2n squared over 5n cubed minus 1. Let's start with the basic. If we take the limit as n goes to infinity of the positive part, if that is not equal with 0, then we're done because we cannot apply the, uh, the alternating series test, yes, but if we apply the divergence test and that was not a 0, then we will not get 0 and hence we won't have convergence at all. We, by the divergence test, we'll have divergence. Now this limit, as we said, will probably be zero to make sure though. We go ahead and apply again the factorization of the denominator. So we get that that is equal with n goes to infinity of two over n times five minus one over n cubed. So we get 5 infinity times 5 here, so we get 0. 2 over infinity is, it will give us 0. Hence, the first condition for the alternating series test converges. Uh, is uh, does hold. We don't yet have convergence. Now, we also need to make sure that this sequence over there, it is positive, which it was. We can easily see that both the denominator of, of the se uh, sequence is positive and the denominator as well. But we need to make sure that decreases also. We haven't checked that as well. If we have the limit goes to zero, which it did, it is positive, which it is, and we saw that the decision that creates a sequence decreases, then by the alternating series test, we have convergence. So let's investigate the derivative of this function. Again, we'll have derivative of the numerator, which will be 4x times the denominator, minus the derivative of the denominator, which is 15x squared, times the numerator, over the denominator squared. So that is equal, if we distribute the multiplication, we get 20x to the fourth, minus 4x, minus 30x to the fourth, over 5x that was cubed, x cubed minus 1 square. So we get minus 10x to the fourth minus 4x over 5x cubed minus 1 square. And we can also take the minus common factor and have 10x to the fourth plus 4x over 5x cubed minus 1 square. Now notice the numerator. It is 10x to the fourth plus 4x, and we plug in only positive values of x. 
Mm, let me write it to a clear page. So derivative was minus ten x to the fourth plus four x or five x cubed plus squared. So the numerator is a positive thing because after we plug in x greater equal than one, that is the series, uh, the values we have for the series. Well, we have n greater or equal than five, uh, three, but even one will do. We have ten times positive plus times something positive, so it is positive the denominator. And the denominator is a perfect square that does not become zero, so it is greater than zero. Hence, when we have the minus in front, the derivative is negative, which implies that the function decreases. And so does the sequence as well. So we have all the conditions for the alternating series test. So by the alternating series test, we have converged. Now, we didn't have absolute convergence. We checked and we get that the series does not converge. So we have conditional convergence because we have convergence of the series, but we do not have absolute convergence of the series. And that gives us the conditional one. Let's go over for C now. Where we will examine an easy world with five to infinity of a ln of two n plus 10 over n plus five with making an alternate with a minus one to the end. Again, we will start with the absolute convergence. So the minus one to the end, when we take absolute value, it will become just one. So I'm gonna immediately write just the positive term. It is ln of two n plus 10 over n plus five. Now for this one, um, we mentioned that when we encounter a len and a polynomial, we rather go for a direct comparison in the previous session. So what to compare with? This would be very close to one over n plus five, that is my guess. So I'm going to do direct comparison with the series 1 over n plus 5, which diverges n is equal with 5 to infinity, either by doing a limit comparison with a harmonic or doing m is equal with n plus 5 to make it the harmonic, starting from 10, if we do that. So this diverges, the one I'm comparing with. So I want this fraction to be greater or equal than 1 over n plus 5. Well, it happens that that is pretty easy in this case. That's why I pick this. Because when we have a degree 1 polynomial and our guess is diverging, then we can say that a ln of n plus 10 is just greater or equal than 1, that is a ln of e. And that happens for sufficiently large n. To be more specific, here it happens even in, a, in n is equal with 0. So it happens for all and greater or equal than five that we're investigating the series from. Now, since we have that, that that is greater and the series based on this one diverges, then we have that by the direct comparison test, the series, mm, sorry, I'm lagging, that was created by taking the absolute value of the sequence diverges. So we don't have absolute convergence again. Let's see if we have the conditional one. Again, I'm going to go for the function that this is based on, of the positive part, of course. Again, we check that if that is positive, x plus five is positive, ln of two x plus 10 is positive. So this is greater than zero. We want it decreasing, and the limit of this to be zero as well. Let's start with the decreasing part that is the hardest. 
And if that holds, then we take the limit that is easy enough to calculate. So the derivative of this will be derivative of the numerator, which is one over two x plus 10, since we have the logarithm, times the derivative of whatever we have inside, so times two, derivative of the denominator times the denominator, minus the derivative of the denominator, which is just one, times the denominator, divided by the denominator square. So let's see if we can do any simplification here. Notice that we can take common factor two from the denominator and have it as, 2 over 2 times x plus 5 times x plus 5. So the x plus 5 with the x plus 5 will cancel out, the 2 will the 2 will cancel out, so this will become just 1. So this is actually 1 minus the logarithm of 2x plus 10 over x plus 5 squared x plus 5 squared will be positive since we're adding, plugging in numbers greater than 5 and we square it as well. And the numerator though, we did mention that ln is always greater than 1 for our values of n. So 1 minus the ln should be smaller than 0. So the derivative is smaller than 0 and that implies that the function is indeed decreasing. Decreasing positive, the only thing left it is that the limit is equal with zero. Let's verify that that is the case. And if it is, then we can immediately say that by the alternating series test, we have conditional convergence since we already excluded the absolute convergence. Now the limit of ln of 2x plus 10 divided by x plus 5, it is of the kind infinity over infinity. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply L'Hopital. This is equal with x goes to infinity. We calculated the derivative of 2x of, of a length of 2x plus 10. It was 2 over 2x plus 10. The derivative of the denominator is just one. So this limit greatly simplifies 2 over 2x plus 10. The denominator goes to infinity while the denominator is stable. So we get zero. And hence by the alternating series test, we get conditional convergence, since we already excluded the absolute convergence. The reason we do that, and we always start from the absolute one is the following. To say that we didn't start from the absolute and we did the conditional, we found that it converges then we need to go ahead and try the absolute convergence as well. Well, again, it won't. So we did as much work in this way. If we find though that immediately that we have absolute convergence, then we can stop. Absolute convergence implies the other, uh, the conditional one. So we're good. So by doing the, conver uh, the absolute convergence first, Worst case scenario, we do as much work as doing it the other way. Best case scenario, we get convergence immediately and we can stop. We're good. Now, let's see D that is an example of that we hit absolute convergence immediately. And then we can stop and claim that. So for D, our version will have sum from one to infinity of sine of one over n divided by three to the n plus five. Now, do we have an alternating to apply the alternating series test? Does the sine of n create the minus one to the n? It does not. It is not the sine of pi over two plus n pi that like the previous case. Sine of n will take any value between minus one and one it won't necessarily stick to minus one and one, but it will take any value in between as long as we plug big enough n. Which implies the following, that we don't have an alternating in the sense that we have a minus one to the n, but we still have infinitely many negative terms. Hence, even if we do not find the absolute convergence, it would be really hard to apply the alternating series test. So 
a best bet it is that a divergence test in that case would be a good call. But let's hope that, which is the case, we get absolute convergence so we don't have to bother with the ultra learning series test. Now, how to do the absolute convergence? Well, the idea is I can compare this series with one over three to the n plus five, or even better with one over three to the n. Well, to be honest, I'm going to compare the absolute value of this series since I want absolute convergence. So for the absolute value now, I would have this. And my guess it is since sign is bounded, I want to compare with the one over three to the n, which is one third to the n. I want to compare with this. This one is a geometric with absolute value of r is equal with one third, which is smaller than one and converges. So I want to make this fraction over here smaller than the fraction of this side. Let's see how to do that. Sine of n in an absolute value over three to the n plus five. It is definitely smaller than one over three to the n plus five. That is because the absolute value of sine of n is always smaller or equal than one. Okay, so I can bound the numerator by this. Now also, the denominator here, three to the n plus five, is bigger than just three to the n because I add five. Hence the fraction is smaller than if I had a smaller denominator. Hence, I here get that, which is one over three to the n, that my sequence is smaller than the sequence that I based my geometric on, and the geometric converts with that r. Hence, by direct comparison test, the series of sine n, n is equal with one to infinity of three to the n plus five, converges absolutely. And at this point, I'm done, since we already mentioned that if we have absolute convergence, we have conditional convergence as well. And hence, we don't need to take it. And that's why we always go for the absolute convergence first, because if we get that, then we are done. If not, we do as much work as we would do if we went the other way around. Let's proceed with the last homework, that is five, and involves the error. For our version, we will find the minimum value of m that guarantees the following. Our version will have the sum from one to infinity, minus one to the n, n over n plus one factorial, Minus, of course, the sum from 1 to m of the same sequence. Absolute value. And we want that smaller than 1 over 100. Quick reminder on what we have on the factorial. The n factorial is equal with 1 times 2 times 3 times m. We also have a reoccurrence relation, n plus one factorial is n factorial times n plus one. And for convenience, we use zero factorial is equal with one to avoid the zero case in the denominator. Now that we have that, let's see, because we don't have just the factorial there, we have a numerator as well, which will make the call for is the sequence decreasing to apply an alternating, to have the alternating series test conditions, which we need in order to, fly, to apply the error bound. Remember the error bound that we have is only based for when we have alternating con the conditions for the alternating series first test. So we need this to be positive, which it is, and decreasing with limit to zero. The limit will be easy to evaluate, but the decreasing part will be hard unless we do cancellations because both the denominator and the denominator increase. So let's investigate the sequence that we sum here. The, just the positive part, of course. The positive part, it is n over n plus one factorial. 
Now on that, I'm going to write the n plus one factorial as n factorial times n plus one. And I can reapply that again, that that is n minus one factorial times n times n plus one. Hence I get the cancellation. I get one over n minus one factorial n plus one times n plus one. That is why I mentioned the zero factorial is equal with one as well to exclude the case of a one is one over zero. Now that I have it in that form, I can easily see the denominator is one, it is stable. The denominator increases, so this fraction decreases. Let's make sure that the limit also goes to infinity. The limit as n goes to infinity of this fraction does go to infinity since both terms in the denominator go to infinity, which is, and then we get to zero. Good, we have all the conditions. Now we can apply the error bound. We have that the error up to m terms is smaller or equal than the m plus one term of the positive part of the alternating series. And that for us is equal with one over n minus one, where I plug in m plus one. So it will be m plus one minus one factorial times n plus one plus one. So that is equal with one over m factorial times m plus two. That is the bound. Now, since we want the error, smaller than or equal than one over a hundred. I'm gonna go ahead and bound the bound of the error to make sure that my error is smaller than one over a hundred. So I'm going to use that to solve the inequality. One over m factorial times m plus two is smaller or equal than one over a hundred. Starting to multiply both sides with 100 m factorial times m plus 2, or just taking reciprocal and flipping the side of the inequality, I get that m factorial times m plus 2 is greater or equal than 100. Now, it is really hard to solve equalities for factorials. Since they can only take integer values and we cannot write them as, fu as functions of x, we don't know how to do that. Instead of that, since they increase pretty fast, I can just plug in the couple first values, bump on to one that is greater than 100, and then I have what my m needs to be at least. Let's see, for n is equal with one, this side becomes one factorial times one plus two, which is equal with one times three, which is three. For n is equal with two, that does not cut it. We have two factorial, which is times two plus two. Two factorial is one times two, so it's just two times four. So we get eight. Next one, for n is equal to three, we have three factorial times three plus two. Three factorial is equal with one times two times three. Two times three is what we care for, times five. So we get six times five, so we get 30. For n is equal with four, we have four factorial times four plus two, which is equal with two times three times four times two plus four is equal with six. So we get two times three gives us six times four times six, which is equal with 24 times six, which is equal with 144. And that is now greater than 100. So we have that for M, is equal with four is what I at least need to do to have that my error is smaller than one over a hundred. And that concludes today's recitation. I wish you a nice afternoon.